you're going into kind of an unknown territory, uncharted, unknown, and that is just simply scary. So there's really no way that I can reassure you that you're going to have everything figured out because the reality is you won't. But I also know equally as well that you will figure it out, that you will survive, that you will adapt and you will conquer. OK, you didn't get into grad school to just say what put up your white flag and say, I quit. You know, you're, you're going to find a way you're going to have to get gritty and you're going to find a way to persevere. Now, that being said, you have to rely on your support. You have to know when to ask for help. Those are big things. And so get over whatever. If there is something that's like your pride or whatever it is, like I can do it. No, 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 no. I'm Jenny Fennell, CRNA and founder of CRNA School Prep Academy. I have always had a passion for helping those who aspire to become a CRNA. A couple of years ago, I started mentoring a handful of prospective students. Fast forward to today, and I have a successful mentoring program that has impacted hundreds of aspiring and now current nurse anesthesia students. What I enjoy the most in my business is connecting with you, the future CRNA. I love learning and growing with you. The road to CRNA is full of unique challenges and no two journeys are the same, but every journey has a learning opportunity. I'm here to share what I have learned over the years, from not just my students, but CRNA community leaders, program faculty, and from my time as a practicing CRNA. This will be your one-stop shop to get the mentoring you need to not only guide you into this career path, but support you all the way through to graduation day. So if you're a nursing student who's exploring the possibility, an ICU nurse actively pursuing CRNA, or a current nurse anesthesia student, you're in the right place. Tune in for inspiration and actionable takeaways that will help you from start to finish. Let's get started. Well, hello, future CRNA. Welcome back to another episode of CRNA School Prep Academy podcast. I'm your host, Jenny Fennell, CRNA. And today we are going to discuss dealing with anxiety or fear around starting your CRNA program or even when you're in it. Um, so many students reach out to me, um, whether they're have, whether they have yet to start or whether they've already started and maybe they're even a year in, but they're kind of in like what I call the thick of it, um, where they're, you know, it's, they're really being tested and their anxiety is really high. Their overwhelms high, their fear is high, and they have bad days that sometimes just really knock them down and they don't know how to get back, uh, from that. So First, I'm going to kind of discuss how to handle the anxiety around starting your CRNA program and the imposter syndrome that sets in and the fear and the overwhelm of like, oh, my gosh, can I really do this? Like, oh, am I really ready? Um, you know, and I also want to reiterate that, you guys, this is a completely normal feeling. I would vouch to say pretty much everyone who gains acceptance to CRNA school probably feels this way at some point or another prior to starting their program. Yes, you're excited, but you're also there's a little piece in your back in your brain that's like, Eh, am I, is this really for me? Like, can I really do this? Am I really smart enough? Am I really capable? Holy moly, I'm getting ready to change my life, you know? And change is scary. Like we're creatures of habit, <laughs> whether we like it or not, we tend to fall into routines. And so you're getting ready to kind of uproot your life, uproot your routine and start all over again, right? As a novice, as a beginner, as a learner. And financially, it's scary. Time-wise, it's scary because you've never experienced this type of strain before, both on your time, um, you know, but also on your finances. So it, there's a lot of fear of unknown whether or not you're going to be okay. And I totally, you know, feel for you. And just let me give you a big virtual hug right now, because just it's okay to be overwhelmed. And just take a big deep breath because I can, I can just feel it for you. Like your chest is getting tight. You know, you feel like the walls are closing in you're just, you're scared and just know that that's a normal emotion to experience. But I also want to reiterate that you will be okay. You know why? Because you've always been okay. You wouldn't have made it here if you didn't have the strength and ability to pursue CRNA. I want to remind you that you were chosen for this. These schools are good pickers. They pick students they know can be successful in their programs. That is the whole point of having the application process and the interview process because they saw what you, they saw it in you. They, they know you have what it takes. Now you have to work on believing that yourself, right? Which is a struggle sometimes. Sometimes other people have more belief in what you have in yourself, and that's a problem. You need to stop and reflect on why you feel that you can't handle this or why you feel fearful and address that why. Um, I speak to it a lot as far as asking why more than once. So you might say, 
you know, Jenny, why do you feel afraid that you can't handle this? And you could just say, well, I just don't know if I'm, if I, if I'm going to be smart enough, if I'm going to be able to get the knowledge that they're teaching me. Well, why is that? Well, maybe because in the past, I haven't always been the best student. Well, why does that scare you? What, what is it about that past history that you think will hinder your ability to currently be successful in, ac- in the academic realm? Well, I don't know, other than the fact that I fear the struggles I had in the past are going to affect me in the future. And that's a very, um, not, an, not a realistic fear, right? I'm fearing the past, and that's not okay. The past doesn't define who I am. I can always work towards my ability and my capability going forward. And yes, maybe I've struggled in the past and maybe things haven't always come easy. But look where I got. I'm, I'm here. I showed up. I did it. I did the things and I succeeded. So why would I not believe that I'm equally as capable of continuing to do that? You should believe in that. You can believe in that. It's up to you to set that mindset to give yourself the chance to succeed. And again, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't have gained acceptance to CRNA school if you didn't believe in yourself. So I know you do, but you're letting that fear kick in and now you're questioning things, right? You're, you're, you're scared. And as a human, when you're feeling the emotions of fear, your natural tendency is to stop, right? I mean, if you were afraid of being hurt, you wouldn't proceed, right? So you're afraid. You're letting that fear stop your ability to move forward and you need to address that now uh, prior to starting school or even when you're in school address this fear if it starts coming up for you Um, but again I want to remind you that you were picked you were chosen you can do this schools are very good pickers so even if you don't believe in yourself know that these programs seed in you and again they're very good pickers okay they don't just pick anyone that's why getting to senior school is so competitive Um, but I really want you to believe in yourself you know as far as doing all the things getting through school successfully, juggling the finances, juggling your personal life and having what feels like very little time compared to what you're used to. What I can say is baby steps. Okay. This is not about going from zero to a hundred. This is about small little tiny adjustments to your personal schedule, to your financial schedule or budget, um, and, and to your ability to adapt your study technique. You have to try to learn how to adapt. You can't adapt until you've at least tried, right? And so while it may seem scary, know that you're going to figure it out. I always like the saying, everything's figure outable. <laughs> I have to repeat that to myself quite often because I'm the kind of person like one of my, I would call it a weakness and a strength because I can argue it both ways and I'm good at arguing <laughs> is that I'm impulsive. And so sometimes I can get myself into trouble from being impulsive because I go all in, right? Before I've really thoroughly thought things through and then I get into it and I'm like, ooh, (laughs) this kind of stinks. Like, ooh, this is hard. This is challenging. This isn't working. But what's beneficial about doing that about my impulsiveness is I, I figure it out, right? I get scrappy. I get gritty and I, and I, I'm in the mud and I'm like, this really stinks. This hurts but I'm not going to stop now, right? It's too late to turn back. You know, it's, it's only one way out and that's forward. And so I, I have to remind myself of that often when I feel overwhelmed or feel scared with what I'm taking on. Cause I, again, with the impulsiveness of me, sometimes I bite off more than I can chew. And there are times where I have to admit that and try to strategize so I can recover from that. But it's the same thing in CRNA school. You're going to be taking on a lot more than what you're used to, but you will adapt. You will find ways to adjust. It's always about seeking out ways to kind of (laughs) cope and strategize so you can keep moving forward. Okay, now your schedule is super heavy. You're putting 60 plus hours in a week. You're you're, you're lacking in self-care. Well, how can I build in self-care into an activity that I already have to do, right? And a lot of times what I would do in school is I would take my notes to the gym and I would study while I worked out, got that physical energy out. I felt good because I wasn't neglecting my studies. That's a win-win. So little things like that, you'll get through that. And then other things too, like relationship-wise. Well, I got to a point in school where I wasn't communicating so much with my significant other because I was exhausted, right? I was tired at the end of the day. I didn't feel like, you know, say, how's my, how's your day? And I, I might've had a bad day, but I don't want to talk about it because I was already stressed. I didn't want to hash it out. I didn't want to cry. I didn't want to experience the emotions around my stress, right? So I just want to talk about it and I would go cry in the shower. Well, that's not healthy, <laughs> right? So what would happen is eventually I'd break where I would just completely lose it and let it all out all my feelings and emotions and I would overwhelm him. (laughs) So what I started doing probably midway through the program, I should have done it sooner, 
is we would have, we would make a point at, at dinner time to at least discuss my day. And if it got to be too emotional where I couldn't discuss it, he would give me that space to just know that that was the end of the conversation. Um, but he would be there for me, right? And it made me feel good knowing I could at least vocalize how I felt without, and knowing that there was a stopping point when I got to the point where I couldn't take it anymore, when I was overwhelmed, that I could at least let him know, like, this was my day and I'm really stressed about it and this is why and I, I can't talk about it anymore. But he knew where I was versus me just not talking about it and him not knowing why I'm quiet, why I'm, I'm more guarded, why I don't want it, like where I'm just shut off, right? He knew I had a bad day. So we started adapting that into our dinner routine every day and that really helped uh, midway through to the very end of the program for him to really kind of know where I was at um, emotionally and mentally within my schooling. And so it really helped our relationship um, we also, you know, I, again, made another mistake where I didn't have these open discussions ahead of time, which I always preach you should do. But a lot of times I preach what you should do, you guys, because I've made so many mistakes and I've learned from those mistakes. Um, but one of the things that I, I mean, I guess I discussed with him that this was going to be a big time commitment and that it was going to be, you know, my studies are a priority, but I think it was one of those things where I said it, but I don't think we really hashed out the how or the why or the true understanding because it still happened, right? He still asked me all the time to do things and I had to always say no. And eventually that really ate at me. That really got to me and it made me angry, resentful, bitter, right? And then I blew up. <laughs> and if I had to say we had any major argument in grad school, it was over that. It's funny. I remember it now. And I don't if you've followed the podcast, you may have heard me mention like me and my husband, we've been together for almost 12 years now, married 12 years, but together since we were 18. So longer than that, like, oh, gosh, almost two decades. Ah, it's crazy. So that being said, or maybe like maybe 16 years, is that 16, 17 years? Yeah, for a long time, um, more than half of my life at this point. Um, but that being said, we don't routinely fight. And, you know, this is probably getting totally TMI, but I grew up, you know, watching fights, right? And I, I always knew as a child, like, I didn't want to marry into that. I didn't want to, I didn't want to deal with my anger with fighting because I thought it was just really toxic. I didn't like it. It didn't make me feel good. So I got really fortunate when I met my husband. He is like <laughs> the sweetest guy ever. We don't, we don't routinely fight or even get mad or even say bad words to each other because it's just not respectful, right? We really own that in our relationship. Um, and I wouldn't say we did this in grad school, but it, it, when I got upset, I got frustrated and I felt resentment towards him. And I remember thinking like, I need to, I need to address this now because, you know, I love him and I don't want to feel resentful towards him just over doing something that he thinks is, is a kind gesture, right? To invite me. Um, so we did, we had to hash that out. And I had to really explain to him that like, as much as I appreciate him asking and inviting me and asking to do all these things, I, I, I'm starting to feel really angry that I have to say no all the time for things I want to say yes to. <laughs> um, and then we laughed about it and it was all good. And then he understood. And what would have helped this, again, that I have the insight now is, and I talk about this in our, in our boot camp, is to block your time and to allow your significant other to contribute to your time block so you know when a designated time is to hang out with them, right? Is to schedule things that you can do outside. Now, obviously things come up, maybe things change, maybe it doesn't always work out, but if you at least like set aside a dedicated space for your significant other, when they, when they do ask you, they will know, well, I shouldn't ask because this weekend they have blocked off for study time, right? But maybe next weekend I can find something for us to do because we have that blocked off for us time. And hopefully it works out to where you really truly can take that space for each other. But at the beginning of every week, so like on a Sunday, sit down and like obviously prior to that Sunday, you should already have a month blocked out, but really get down to the nitty gritty the, the week before. So like on Sunday, you really hash out, this is my this is all my to-do list this week. This is where I think I have personal time. This is where I have couple time. This is where I have meal prep time. Whatever it is you find important, I call it like your fundamental needs. Whatever your fundamental needs are, you block out that time during your week and you let your significant other know, this is the time I have for you, honey. <laughs> so if you have something you want to do together, let's plan it for this time. Um, or it could be the opposite. Like this is a really busy week for me and I'm going to have to work through the weekend. And so there's going to be no me and you time other than maybe like a Netflix show before bed. Like that's, that's really all we got for this week. And then they know that week they can't ask you. And so that could have alleviated some of that, um, issues I had in school. But you know, I, again, you're going into kind of an unknown territory, uncharted, unknown, and that is just simply scary. So there's really no way that I can reassure you that, you're going to have everything figured out because the reality is you won't. But I also know equally as well that you will figure it out, 
that you will survive, that you will adapt, and you will conquer, okay? You didn't get into grad school to just say, what, put up your white flag and say, I quit. You know, you're, you're gonna find a way, you're gonna have to get gritty and you're gonna find a way to persevere. Now, that being said, you have to rely on your support. You have to know when to ask for help. Those are big things. And so get over whatever, if there is something that's like your pride or whatever it is, like I can do it. No, 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 no. Like if that, if you feel that way, like I'm gonna be okay, I can do this, I can do this. Cause I'm like that too, you guys. I'm like, my pride sometimes gets in the way where I don't wanna ask for help because I feel like I should be able to handle it. But then I don't and I, and I suffer the physical uh, consequences and have a mental breakdown. Um, I have to really check myself sometimes because when I get so overwhelmed and I take so much on my plate, I have to recognize when I'm doing that and say, I think it's time to hit the brakes a little bit. And how can I take more off my plate? How can I delegate? How can I say no? It's really about setting boundaries. And I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. Sometimes setting those boundaries feels really hard and really icky, right? To say no. It feels and like if you're a people pleaser, like hands up. I'm there. I'm, I'm a people pleaser. It is what it is. <laughs> I mean, uh, I try, but I, I, mo I enjoy I enjoy pleasing others, right? I enjoy making people happy. It brings me joy. So that's a big part of who I am. Um, but sometimes at the sacrifice of my own happiness, right? So I have to really be cognizant when I'm stepping over that boundary. And even though it might be, mean saying no or not taking the time to answer someone's question right at the moment, I have to say no. This is my family time. This is my evening. I'm not answering questions after this time. I only answer questions this way. So if... You know, I have to really set boundaries because otherwise it eats into my personal time and eats into my time with my family and that feels icky, right? And then that's when you start building resentment and that's not what you want. Like you don't want resentment towards school, towards things that you enjoy doing. So by setting boundaries, it allows you to still enjoy what you're doing um, while also still having some personal time to enjoy outside of your school. So that's kind of my recommendation too, is to kind of recognize when you're doing that and set boundaries. And again, it's not always gonna feel good. It's gonna feel kind of hard and icky to set boundaries and say no. But um, ultimately, at the end of the day, you can't fill someone else's cup when your cup's empty or your cup is empty. So you have to fill your cup before you can pour into others. So remember that. All right, let's kind of get into a little bit on, I've already touched on mindset a little bit, but you guys, mindset's huge. And I think this really comes into play when you start your clinicals or even the academics and say you don't get the grade you want or you don't get the skill that you hope to achieve in clinical or you don't get like you get kind of a hard critique from your preceptor or whatever it may be. You have something happen that kind of makes you question again your ability or um, your, you know, who you are, your self-worth, right? This is a mindset thing because you're always going to be tested in life, whether you're in grad school, whether you're working as a CRNA, a parent, you know, a spouse, you name it, a, a mother, sister, brother, you're going to be tested and have these feelings around, am I enough? Am I doing enough? Am I a good person? Am I deserving? Am I worthy? Like, I think naturally as a human, you question that about yourself, which if you don't take the right mindset around it and give yourself grace when you even least deserve it, you will eat at your core. And that's not what you want because you know what? We're all human. We all make mistakes. We all have flaws. We need to own those flaws and be okay with them. And the people who really love you will also be okay with their with those flaws. Because you know what? They have flaws too and you still love them. So think about it that way. Like, okay. Okay, so you have a friend and maybe that friend can sometimes annoy you, right? But you still love them. I mean, same thing with your spouse. Maybe your spouse can annoy you sometimes, but you still love them. Okay, you, you take the good and the bad. With every human being, every relationship, you accept the good and the bad that comes with it, including your own children. Okay, your children are going to mess up quite often. And as it to be teenagers, ooh, they're going to be kind of icky sometimes, but you still love them. You take the good and the bad. So as humans, when, you know, you love others, you accept the good and the bad. So why not? practice that with yourself. You have to love yourself in a way that you accept the good and the bad. Okay. So that's a mindset issue. And you really need to start addressing that if you're finding yourself beating yourself up and just recognizing it. That's part of the whole thing. If you recognize when you're doing it, it's going to allow you to deal with it. It doesn't mean you're going to probably stop doing it because as humans, I think naturally we always gravitate towards stuff like that, unfortunately, but you can train your brain to quit it, right? You can train your brain to, when you start going there to recognize and say, no, nope, eh, stop right now. Don't do it anymore. Just cut off that voice, address why you're doing this and go from there. And so that's kind of what I've had to do. And what I suggest you do is just being more cognizant when you're kind of getting into that place of self-judgment um, and accept the fact that no doesn't mean never and no is or no not yet that 
in time, it will come. And even if you didn't perform your best or do your best, or if you messed up, or if you had a bad day, your attitude was kind of crappy. Well, you know what? You have bad days too, and that's okay. Because even the best CRNA, even the best attending, even the best anyone has a bad day where their attitude kind of sucks, right? You know, we preach attitude all the time. And yes, you should be aware of that. But if you're having a bad day and it affects your attitude, give yourself a little bit of grace and try to show up better next time. But don't beat yourself up over having a bad day and not being on your game, not being the best that you could be. Because we're all going to be in that place at some point, um, you know. And, you know, like for like for me as a preceptor now, I can't say can't speak for all preceptors, but I would like to think that the majority of them can recognize when a student is maybe having an off day that they've been with before. The hard part is if you've never been with a student and the first experience you have with a student is when they're on their off day, right? Then you're kind of what questioning, well, are they always like this or is this like out of the norm, right? And sometimes you just don't know because you've only had one opportunity to work with that student. That can be a little hard and a little tricky, but what I recommend for you to do is if you really feel out of sorts or you have something personal going on, you have to speak up. You know, you could say, you know, I, you know, I'm here to learn. I'm excited for the day. You know, this is how I prepped. But just so you know, my dog is sick in there in the hospital last night and I'm, I'm, I'm really fatigued and tired. So if I seem off, that's why. But I'm here. I'm showed, I, sh I showed up. I'm here to do this. But I, I wanted to let, give you a heads up that maybe my, I might be more emotional today than, than normal. Cool. Like, I get it. Like, we're all human. We've all had pets. We've all, you know, and whether it's a pet or whether it's a relationship issue, whether it's a, I mean, you don't have to go into details. You could just say, I have something personal going on in my life right now that's causing me a lot of stress. And I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm here to do my best. But I want to let you know if I seem a little off or if I seem a little um, distressed, it has nothing to do with today. Um, but I'm, I'm going to do my best to be here, be present. Give them a heads up. Again, because we're all human. And I would hope that if they have any heart at all, they'd be like, I got you. I got you, boo. Like, we're, we're going to get through this day, you know? And, you know, because they remember what it was like being a student. They remember having those difficult times where they were dealing with some kind of personal issue or whatever it may be, but yet they had to still go to clinical all day long and fight through the tears, right? Because not because they were sad because in clinical, but because they had something going on in their personal life that was really causing them a lot of emotional distress, um, and reach out to your programs if this happens to you guys. They want you to be successful. And the last thing they want you to do is have something bad happen because you're dealing with some kind of personal issue that you didn't speak up about. And now it's caused a bad test grade or a bad, uh, really bad clinical experience or whatever it may be. You need to let your programs know. OK, um, I always say this, you know, you get into CRNA school, but your life doesn't stop. You know, the stresses of your life will still happen regardless of whether you're in CRNA school. I pray that for all of you, nothing totally dramatic or terrible happens during your time in school. But even just in my short time being in school, my classmates, for example, had to go through death of a parent, um, a sick parent who had cancer. Uh, I mean, our dog got sick and that for me, that was stressful because I, mean, I love my dog. My dog, you know, found out he had no immune system and he was I mean, it was suppressed and had mange and all kinds. I mean, it was crazy. I had to like it was insane. It was also expensive, <laughs> you know, to have a sick dog. Um, but that being said, like, you know, there's always something like my car broke down once and I was like, oh, my gosh, am I going to afford to fix my car? And, you know, we had uh, I had a brother in law who was really sick and had, you know, issues going on and we had to temporarily take him in. And that was stressful. Like, you know, again, things like that happen because life will still happen. Um, but you have to really recognize when it's important to reach out, um, you know, I had you know, maybe the only issue I can think of that I actually had to reach out about in school because it really, really got to me was um, I had a preceptor who was really, really hard on me. And it really made me question whether I was, whether I should be doing CRNA. And it's really unfortunate when that happens. And I'm, I'm speaking this and telling and sharing this with you because it even happens to, happens to a lot of people and they may not, they might not speak up about it. Um, but this particular uh, situation was multiple occurrences where I just kind of felt like I was being bullied and I, I don't know. It made me question. It made, and eventually it got to me. Eventually I wasn't able to put like that barrier up and say, no, Jenny, it, you're OK. You're doing fine. It's just them. <laughs> like that's typically how I cope with stuff like that, where I'm like, eh, they treat other people like that, too. It's all good. I'll, whatever. I'll just r brush off my shoulder. And nine times out of ten, I still am like that, where if someone's nasty to me, whether it be a surgeon or a coworker or anyone for that matter, I'm like, eh okay, well, I'm not your cup of tea and maybe it's not your day and I'm okay. Like, I'm going to still be happy. I'm still me. I'm still going to keep going. And if I did something wrong, call me out. Tell me about it. I'll apologize. Move on. Like, 
freaking tell me. Like, I, I passive aggressiveness never does anyone any favors. If I do something that makes you mad, then freaking tell me. I'll work on it. Like, but I don't, if I don't know, I don't know. And I'll keep pissing you off, <laughs> you know? So just tell me and get over it. But again, sometimes if it happens enough, it really does start making you question um, whether, you know, whether you are the problem. And um, I mean, I was things like you're too nice. You know, you don't have a backbone. Like I was told I don't have a backbone to do this profession. I was like, who would say that? Like, first of all, but it, it did get said to me. And you know what? I do have a backbone. I mean, you push me and I will, I will. <laughs> but at the same token, when I'm in, when I'm in a professional role, I am kind, I am courteous, I am lenient because I'm a team player, right? I, 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 I'm open to input. I'm open to suggestions. I don't, I don't fight, you know, I'm, I'm open. Like we're all here for one reason to take care of the patient. So why do I have to be like, you know, I, I don't need to be, I don't need to fight. I'm here to like work together as a team. You know, if, if you really make me mad though, I mean, ask my husband, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm a tiger sometimes, you know, where I have, you know, blame it on my dad, you know, Irish temper, whatever you want to call it. I do have a short fuse, but I also know how to control that fuse, <laughs> especially when I'm at work and that's my professional role. When I'm at home, I might have, you know, I might, I might lose it at, more than I should, but you know, it is what it is. Um, but that being said, it really got to me where I was like, am I too meek and mild? Do I not voice my opinion enough? Am I just not cut out for this? Would I, would I potentially lead to patient harm? So I'm not willing to speak up. Like that's what it made me question. And it was really hurtful. And it was like little things like this again, over time kind of built up. And so I did reach out, um, to a certain point and I was reassured that I'm okay, that everything's going well, that I mean, mo like, every other preceptor I've ever had in the history of my clinical was like, great job, great job, great job. It's just this one person. So it was really an isolated event. Um, so that was really kind of like reassuring for me. Um, I also remember getting to a point when I was getting ready, to, I was pretty close to graduation. I was definitely in my first, through into my senior year. I did a really challenging case, offsite cases, uh, sick, sick patients. And um, I don't, I remember I didn't get an IV. And I remember I got asked a question I didn't know the answer to, just like little things like that, you know, like nothing major. For the most part, I was really prepared, did fine, you know, and my preceptor gave me a compliment at the end of the day. He just, he just said, really nice job today. I, it's always been a pleasure to work with you. And I said, oh, I didn't do a great job. And I, I don't, it just came out so quickly out of my mouth, like, oh no, I didn't do a great job. Like it was just, bleh. <laughs> right? But it's because I had already started telling myself that and beating myself up over little things like not knowing the answer to this question or not getting my IV or feeling sloppy or slow or, or maybe slobbering the ambu bag with a spitty glove or whatever it was. I don't even remember. But he immediately was like, why did you do that? Like, why? You just essentially shut down my compliment. And I'm like, yeah, that's a good point. I don't know why. I don't, I don't, I don't know. And you're right. And I shouldn't have done that. And I'm sorry. And thank you. Like, thank you for the compliment. I appreciate that. And it was one of those things where it was like an eye-opening moment, like, how much and how often have I been doing this throughout my schooling? Like, okay, maybe if I hadn't been doing this to myself the whole time, I wouldn't have experienced as much stress or as much um, kind of self-doubt, if, if you want to call it that, if I just would have recognized when I was really beating myself up unnecessarily, right? Um, I even just think of an example, like I just had a student the other day. She did a great job. She's only been at our site. <laughs> this was her third day. And it's a specialty rotation like peds. That's a big specialty rotation. And it's extreme, extremely nerve wracking um, as an SRNA to go into your peds rotation, especially if you don't have a peds background <laughs> prior to going into anesthesia school. Um, and she did great. And, you know, I, I, our attending asked her some questions that she didn't know or that she mixed up a little bit, but she still did a great job, especially considering it's her third day. Um, and I told her such at the end of the day. And I, I didn't, you know, she didn't, met, she didn't come across that she was questioning any of that. Like she seemed pretty like, okay, well, thank you and everything. But that was kind of me. Like I would usually say thank you, but I would, if I got anything wrong, meaning if attending asked me any question and I couldn't like 100% answer it, I would feel bad about myself. And I wouldn't speak up about that, but I ultimately would. And that's toxic. That is toxic. That is what led me to the place of blocking the compliment, right? That's what led me to a place of saying, no, I didn't do a good job, like automatically, like just because I got so used to when I didn't do something 100% that automatically reflected on that I wasn't good enough or I wasn't enough or I wasn't doing my best or I wasn't putting my best effort in, right? That's toxic. That's the kind of stuff that will really eat away at you. So you really have to recognize when you're doing that and also understand you guys, you will have people in your life as a preceptor who are just not nice and they're not good preceptors. 
you have to accept the fact that, you know, occasionally you will run into people like that and you really do have to just brush it off your shoulder and, and know that that's just that one person and you're going to be okay. And you're not going to be everyone's cup of tea. Like I said, I mean, it's okay if you don't like me. I don't expect everyone to like me. You know, I, you know, I be perfectly honest. I don't like everyone I meet, but am I respectful? A hundred percent. I don't care how mean and nasty you are. I will always be respectful because I think that's a natural human courtesy to be respectful. doesn't mean I have to ever associate with you again or even try to speak to you again, but it doesn't mean I'm mean or nasty in return. I, you know, I, I'm going to be bigger than that. Like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to lower myself to that level. You know, I will just be polite as, as possible back. And what I've found by kind of adapting that like mindset of just kill meanness with kindness is a lot of time these people who are routinely mean tend to eventually be nice to you over time because you're never mean back. They don't, they're not, they're not fighting you anymore. They're like, it's hard to be mean to someone who's really nice. Like, think about it. If someone's really nice to you, even when you know you are, you know, a B something, it's hard to actually be mean back over time. Maybe initially, maybe they get some kind of weird, like, I don't know, people just like being mean, right? Some people are get like a high off, off, showing their dominance or I have no idea what I don't know what it's like being a bully luckily I've never never been one um but that being said what I have found people who tend to have that tendency to do that it over time if you're just as nice as possible and trying to interact as least as possible obviously you have to to care for the patient but over time it, it lessens up like they get less and less mean because it's not as fun right they know they don't they don't get a rally out of you they don't get a an emotion out of you you're just like all right, well, I have nothing to say to that. I'm just going to walk away. Like, okay, cool. Thank you for your input. And, you know, if you if you don't really give them any any flare back, you know, they again, it doesn't really get them that high that, that I think a lot of them seek when they are like that. So that's my biggest piece of advice. Um, luckily, once you are a CRNA, you don't have to work. Like, I mean, you work with an attending or if you're at all independent practice, you'll occasionally have, you know, a CRNA come and help you with an induction or whatever it may be, depending on your practice. But for the most part, you practice pretty independently. So it's really your interaction with the surgeon and things like that. And again, their priority is doing the case. Yes, they have to communicate with you. You communicate with them, but it's it's just way easier. And I, I think as a student, you kind of lose sight of that because you're so used to having to work with a preceptor and kind of being under the under the the beating eyeballs of like, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know, and, and kind of like always on edge, like, I don't want to make a mistake because they're going to watch, they're going to see it. And what if I, you know, what if I'm incorrect? And so you're kind of always under a lot of pressure as a student, but you're not as a CRNA as much. You kind of get more space to independently think. And it's so rewarding <laughs> once you get there. Um, so hold out. It is coming. You just got to stay the course. And if you're feeling like like you're not enough, you have to really, you have to speak up and you have to say something. You have to recognize when that's happening. Because you guys, if I had listened to that advice, like I don't have a backbone to do this, what if I just would have quit? That's sad to think that someone else would have that kind of an impact on my future. Uh-uh, no thanks, no, not, no. Like 100%, no way. <laughs> no one else is gonna decide my future. That is up to me. Um, and I hope that you embrace that same concept. So hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Hugs and stick with it. You'll be okay. You're going to start school. You're going to rock it. And even if you don't rock it, it's okay. You're going to rock you because you're there. You're showing up and that's all you can do. So cheers. You got this and I'm here for you. I'll see you guys next week. future CRNA. As always, I appreciate you and your loyalty. Thank you so very much for tuning in this week. I'd love to hear from you. So screenshot this episode and share it to your IG stories with your biggest takeaway. Don't forget to tag me at CRNA School Prep Academy so I can personally thank you. Be sure to head over to CRNAschoolPrepAcademy.com to check out our blog and gather free resources to help you along your CRNA journey. Stay strong and I'll see you next week.